take out a Bible and go to John chapter 4, stand up on your feet. If you are new around here, my name is Mike Patz. I'm one of the pastors, and it is a joy to have you with us. We're in a series called Navigate, and it's really about navigating the challenging scenarios of the real world that we live in. And today we're going to really go at really a topic, I think, that, that hits all of us at some level. So if you're ready for this, for have Jesus teach us, say, let's do it. John 4, starting in verse 3. So Jesus left Judea and he went back once more to Galilee. Now when he was there in Galilee, it says he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon, the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews don't associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He said her, told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you've had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and now has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. I've heard this passage preached so many times. One of the very first sermons I ever heard was from this passage. And Jesus never ceases to amaze me with his brilliance and his power and his glory. And I am just praying that this is going to be a day when you're going to see it and that we're going to see it freshly. Let's pray. God help. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Let's talk about navigating conflict. A couple months ago, I was on a plane, and I got into a long conversation with a man, Jewish man, that let me know he does not believe in God, and he ended up finding out I was a Christian, and as soon as he found out that I was a Christian, and we found out I'm, I'm like one of those Christians, you know, like a Bible kind of Christian or whatever, his posture changed, his, his facial expressions changed, and he looked at me and he asked me this. I just have one question for you. Do you believe a woman has a right to do what she wants to do with her body? And I was like, oh, here we go. <laughs> it was the litmus test for him. It was the litmus test of culture, the litmus test of humanity. He knew he would be able to size me up with my answer to the female question. How do we navigate conflict? How, how, do we, how are we going to navigate the 2024 election? 
Like, what are you saying to people when they ask you, hey, hey who, who are you voting for in this next election? You know? How do we navigate... How do we navigate the, the moment that we're in when, it, when someone asks you the abortion question, when someone asks you to be in their wedding and, and it's a trans couple getting married and you're like, okay, I, I've been friends with them for years, and, but I'm a church person or, you know, and like, how do we, what are we supposed to think about a friend that tells you they're getting divorced or a brother that tells you that he's cheating on his wife? How do we navigate all the stuff. I'm praying for peace and courage today as we, as we look at these things because, in my opinion, we are very much missing each other on most issues of conflict, not just culturally, but personally, like in marriages with families and brothers and sisters. And when we miss each other, at least culturally, we tend to just yell louder. We, we seem to think that if we yell a little bit louder, maybe we will be a little more convincing. Maybe if we... If we yell, maybe if you put it in all caps, our social media comments are going to then convince the other side as we slide into someone's social media post and let them know how wrong they are. And we correct them and to the cheers and likes of many of the people that click those easy likes without any accountability behind it. We tend to assume the worst about our opponents and the people in whom we are in conflict, with whom we are in conflict. We tend to draw caricatures, cartoon caricatures of the people on the other side. And when they speak, it triggers us. And we, we are, we're, we're really, many, many of us are easily triggered now. There are many, like there's not just one or two. There are triggers everywhere. I mean, it's like if gun violence is a thing, I mean, trigger violence is a very real thing socially and intellectually and emotionally. And when it comes to conflict, some of us hate it so much that we avoid it. Like many, if we're honest, a lot of us just run from it. We're like, I don't want to get into this. We walk out of the room. Some of us don't avoid it. Some of us, uh, we weaponize it. When there's conflict, we, we become like a bulldozer and we go all out. Many of us, in fact, most of us mishandle conflict when it does come. And yet when we watch Jesus, he takes a moment of conflict and he turns it into a life-transforming situation in someone else's life. And he changes history with a story that has been told now for 2,000 years, how did Jesus take a volatile, wild, crazy situation of a Samaritan woman, Jews and Samaritans hated each other, how does Jesus turn that into something that thousands of years later people are using for peace? They, they tell you in news circles that if it bleeds, it leads. That we, we, we already know CNN has monetized conflict. Fox News has monetized conflict. Conflict. Social media platforms, they have monetized. They are incentivized to divide. They, are incent they sell Honda Accords on anger, not peace. You do not get people looking at your social media posts with peace. You do it by creating a storm. And yet Jesus shows up on scenes and he looks at storms and says, peace be still. I think it's time again for the church of Jesus to not just invite Jesus to be our Lord and Savior, but to become our Prince of Peace again. How do we navigate conflict like Jesus? Because this passage is like so incredible. Jesus gives a master class on how to navigate conflict, how to calm storms, even when there's fights coming up, even when the demonic Realm comes to bring and in, in instigate. Jesus finds a way to calm the storms. And even right now, I declare in the name of Jesus, calm. So how do we do it? I'm only going to say two things today, and it's this. If you want to navigate like Jesus, first connect with their humanity, then direct to his divinity. First, connect to, to their humanity, the person you're in conflict with. Then, direct them to his divinity. And Jesus will do both. But let's break it down. In verse 4, it, it says that he had to go through Samaria. I, I love this verse, he had to, because if you look at the map, he didn't have to. Like, it, when you're looking at the map, if you pull the map up here, uh, most Jews took the path that you could kind of see here because Jews and Samaritans hated each other. I was driving to Orlando this week and there was terrible traffic. I don't know if any, it seems like traffic is worse than it's ever been on I-75. So if someone can cast out that demon, that'd be great, right? 
And I'm, I'm getting ready to drive down, so I look on my GPS, and, and it was a similar time to be, I could go straight down I-75 and get stuck in a lot of traffic right out, right south of Gainesville, where I live, if you're watching, in another part of the world. And if you looked on your maps, it shows you all the bad traffic. Or I could go through Williston, go down some road, somewhere else, same amount of time, but I didn't have to stop. I so despise sitting in standstill traffic, I was actually willing to add 20 miles to my trip to just keep moving and see the scenery. That's what I did. Okay? I dislike sitting in a car, a non-moving car, so much, I would rather put more miles on my car, right? Jews disliked that place called Samaria so much, they would rather put miles on their feet, go around the other side of the Jordan, go down there if they're trying to go up to Galilee. That's what they would rather do because even though Samaria was not a separate political entity, they were defined by a history and a religious political reality that that the Samaritans from the days of King Omri, they had become these mixed group where the Jewish people that were in Samaria, they mixed with Gentiles and they didn't just mix, they, they threw out parts, I mean, there's, they, they ended up throwing out parts of the Bible, they would only use the Pentateuch, they, 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 were, in, in, they were political um, burdens, they were like a thorn in people's political side, they were political rebels, they were racial half-breeds and they were religious heretics. So at every turn and in every way, these were the, they were the other. They were shunned and they were hated and they were despised. And yet Jesus had to go through Samaria. It says Jesus was tired. Now what's stunning is we're about to watch Jesus put on his divine clothing when he's about to let a woman that's been married five times let her know, I don't know, you don't know me and I've never met you, but I know things about you because I'm actually the Lord of Lords. I'm actually the one that's got all the skills to pay all the bills. That's me. This is who I am. And yet what's stunning is that the God of the universe on the earth, full of knowledge and power, arrives and somehow he's tired. Why was Jesus tired? Because before he directs us to his divinity, he connects with our humanity. Because he knows how to weep, and he knows how to sweat, and he knows how to bleed. And he knows how to get weak. And he, and he comes, and he gets in our shoes. Guys, please do not miss this. He gets in our shoes. You, you have to catch this. Because when you're in conflict, it's so easy to say, yeah, but they should have known already. Yeah, but she's got the power in this situation. Yeah, but, but he should know better. Like, I, I get all of it. What I'm telling you is before he redirects, before he corrects, before he rebukes, before he calls out sin, he gets in our shoes. Martin Luther King Jr. would lead the civil rights movement. And if you've ever read, like, the history, Parting the Waters, if you've ever read, like, the the biography of Martin Luther King, part of the interesting thing about his life was he wasn't just, like, the main guy in the civil rights movement. you got to understand, he didn't start off as the main dude. He ended up as the main dude, not just because he got shot. It's because... He would be in rooms when, and when there was infighting going, in, going on within the civil rights movement. There was much debate and conflict about how this should go down. Martin, of course, is advocating for nonviolence and, and for the, the way of Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount really was. I mean, the civil rights movement, especially coming through MLK, is coming through the, the black church and, and churches and the words of Jesus and things like this. And, and anyway, you've got some of this infighting that would sometimes go on. There'd be heated debating going on around tables, and they say that Martin Luther King would sit there and he would listen and listen and listen and listen and listen. And when everyone had spoken and everyone had vented and everyone had given their thoughts, then he would speak. It was like like something out of James chapter 1, like verse 19, when James says, let each of you be quick to listen and slow to speak. And slow to become angry because the anger of humans does not produce the righteousness of God. And then he would speak. And when he spoke after having listened, when he spoke after having connected, after having let them away, I I think I heard you say this. And and I I think I see what you're saying here. When he spoke, then, then he could turn the room around, they would say. 
because he connected with their humanity and he connected with their pain and he validated their experience. And Jesus is letting this woman tell her story. He's letting her speak her experience. He's letting her come and bring her life. And, and he's tired and, and he's weary and, and, it's, and he asks her for a drink and she's like, what's up with this? And, and, and it's just so wild that when the Samaritan woman comes to draw water and he says, give me the drink. And she's a Samaritan woman. I, I just want to point out, he is looking for who she is. All she can see in him is a tired Jewish man, but he sees in her something other than a weary Samaritan woman. Friends, I, I'm hoping, I want us, I'm begging for us to stop looking at people just as the weary, the Samaritan woman, the white man, the, the, black, the, 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 the black woman, the, the Asian lady, the, the, the German, the, the former German, whatever, the, the Indian, the Pakistani, whatever. Like, do you understand there's so much more? That's not, we don't take that away from us. Listen, to, to be sure, Derwin Gray, would, he would, you know, writes a book, he says, when he talks about being colorblind, he says, colorblind ideology is prevalent in the American church, and those who say, I don't see color, are thought to be virtuous. And he says, I get the sentiment behind the statement, but it's flawed and damaging. It is flawed because God created our different ethnicities and colors. Every human bears the image of God, for each ethnicity is a mirror that reflects God's image back to the world in a unique way. To be blind to the beauty of our diverse colors and cultures is to miss an aspect of God's creative genius. So we, we do not like to, oh, Ruthie, are you a woman? I did not notice. I'm gender blind, you know? When I look at my wife, I know what gender she is. I, I do. When, when you see someone's color, there's nothing good to say, well, I don't notice that. No, it's, it, it's good to notice that. But don't stop at that. She is a Samaritan woman, but she's not just a Samaritan woman. He is a weary Jewish traveler, but he's not just, but that's all she can see. And so he says, give me a drink. She says, well, what, what do you, you want to have something to do with me? Why, why would you have anything to do with me? Because I, I know what you guys are like. You, you guys look at me and you think I'm unclean. Let me read you from a rabbi. It was Jewish law in Jesus' day. Here's a quote. All daughters of Samaritans are in a perpetual state of ceremonial uncleanness. Now, that's what they would say about Samaritan women. About women in the first century, there were rabbis that said this. One rabbi said, I would rather burn the Torah. I'd rather burn the Bible than to teach the Bible to a woman. Just so you guys know, any of you that feel like the Bible's like sexist and all this kind of stuff, you, you really need to go read Jesus in context. Like if you've ever read one of the miracles of Jesus, where it says that Jesus, he was teaching them and he, and, and he multiplied loaves and fishes. Remember this, it'll say like he fed 5,000 men and then there was women and children. And a lot of us are like, oh, that's so offensive. They didn't put the women in the number. No, friends, do you understand this? Women were often not taught. The Bible is actually making the point. Jesus was teaching women. And in Jewish circles, you only taught people because the idea was they would become teachers of what they're being taught. So when, when the Bible is making clear in multiple places, all these men plus women and children, I'm telling you, a lot of you guys have dumbed down the genius and revolutionary tendencies of Jesus to our detriment. Some of you have these revolutionary tendencies inside of you. You want to go turn the world upside down? Trust me, the one you are thirsty for is Jesus the Messiah. That's who you want. But he's connecting with her humanity. She's the wrong race. She's the wrong gender. She's the wrong religion. She's had five husbands living with a man now. She's the wrong lifestyle. And yet he says, would you give me a drink? Could I drink after you? She's like, what? I know how things work. You say I'm ceremonial unclean. If, I, if you drink after me, you'll get dirty. And in all of history, this is how it works. If you're not sick and someone else is sick, they give you AIDS. They give you COVID. They give you a disease. They give you the flu. But Jesus isn't everybody. Because everybody else, when clean touches unclean, the clean gets unclean. But he's like, woman, if you knew who I was, I am the one place in the universe that when you come to me, when I touch you, I make you clean. Breaks my heart when I talk to people. I say, you want to come to church this Sunday? They're like, ah, 
I need to clean up my act first. I'm like, where did you hear that? All of us are the Samaritan woman in this room. All of you online, we're all the Samaritan woman. It's all of us. We don't clean up to come to him. We come to him to get cleaned up. That's the only way it happens. It's like saying I can't go wash my hands because my hands are dirty. You're a Jew, you're going to drink from me. See, he's connecting with her humanity. He's connecting with her humanity. She's wrong in every sense of the word. Everything she's ever seen has been stay away. Why is she there at noon? Because noon's the one time it's, there, she's not going to be shamed by the women that come in the morning and the women that come at night. And this is a, this is a task, man. Like, this is something you did in groups. I mean, by the way, just to put, just to, for the context, that we're not talking about, she's not going to the water fountain. She's going to the well to get her drinking water, her bathing water, her cleaning water, her laundry water, her everything water. You don't have water, you get sick, your life shuts down. This is a truckload of water. This is a significant thing. You did this in groups because you could take more stuff. A woman by herself, all on her lonesome. What a bummer this is. She's avoiding someone, if not everyone, to be in this place. And Jesus had an appointment at noon in Samaria with an unnamed Samaritan woman. Not trying to draw more out of this than that's there, but let me just give you the, where this is at in the, in the Bible. This is John 4, John 3. One chapter earlier, we've got another encounter of Jesus with another person. But this person's not an unnamed Samaritan woman. It's a named Jewish man named Nicodemus. Famous God so loved the world passage, John 3, 16. Famous you must be born again passage. A, a man, Jewish, leader, powerful, chicken, comes by night to meet with Jesus. Has this encounter with Jesus that we hear about it because John tells us what happened. But Nicodemus didn't do very much that we can tell with this message we're going to find out before this is done, this woman's about to have an encounter with Jesus. Uh, not a named, powerful Jewish man. It's an unnamed, nobody, Samaritan woman that's going to go into the city, and she's about to lead the entire city to the Lord, and history is going to get changed because of this woman. What a contrast. If you feel like you're wrong, you're right. But he's got all the power, and when you drink from his well, you shift. You change unnamed Samaritan women, turn history upside down, and make no small disturbance wherever they go. First, he connects with her humanity. In Genesis, it says that all of us are made in the image of God. Andrew Peterson says, there are no unsacred places. There are only sacred and desecrated places. In that spirit, there are no unsacred moments. There are only sacred moments and moments that we have forgotten are sacred. It is our duty to reclaim the sacredness of our lives. There are not sacred and unsacred people. There are people that have been desecrated at wells all over Samaria and Gainesville and Alachua and Pakistan and, and Canada in Kentucky, and wherever you're from. There are, there are all of these desecrated, the people that you go, there are no ordinary people that you work with. Everyone that you work with was made by, made by the one that was meeting her at this well. When she sees Jesus, of course, all she sees is, is a man. Jesus says in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him. And he would give you living water. She said, give it to me then. Give it to me. Where, where are you going to get this water? Jesus says, everyone who drinks this will thirst again. See, what, what I want you to see here is Jesus is connecting with her. He's looking at her. We're gonna, she's about to start trying to argue. He won't argue. Everyone say, don't argue. No, no, don't argue. Don't, don't argue. When you, you're going to talk to someone this week. And when you do, and, and, you're in, and maybe you ask someone, hey, could I pray for you? And they say, sure, and you pray for them. And then and their heart starts to, to melt, and their eyes start to water. And you say, hey, man, Jesus loves you. He loves you a lot. Can I tell you my story? And you tell them, and they're like, oh, my. And, I mean, I've been like this. People, their hearts, their eyes start to water. And, and then they'll say something, well, wait a minute. But what about the dinosaurs? Do you believe in a literal six days of creation? Do you believe that the earth is only 6,000 years old? I'm like, is there a manual that says, ask Christians these questions because they are suckers to fall for these every time? Well, could we talk about the Crusades? 
Well, what do you think about all the church hurt? What, do you, what, about, all the, what about all the abuse? What about all the, 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 the priests that have molested kids? What, what, do you, what, what about the gay issue? What about the abortion issue? See, it's, it's, it's amazing how much the enemy knows. Listen, when someone needs Jesus, la única cosa, the only thing on the table right now is Jesus. That's what someone needs. They don't need your philosophy on one of these side issues. You could say these are very important issues. Oh, they are. What I'm saying is you're going to find she tries to argue. Jesus will not argue with her. He won't. Because you can't look at somebody when you're arguing with that same somebody. And he sees her. She, all she sees in him is his skin. All she sees, you Jewish man, but he knows that she's more than a Samaritan woman because he was there in that womb when she was being created. And, and by the way, I, I, friends, we need to look at each other. Like, people need to be seen. They need to be understood. They need to be recognized. It's, it, it's my, it is my push-off on, you know, what, and I hate using the word purity culture and throwing the purity culture under the bus for the millionth time in the last two years or whatever, but... But but it is the problem when people say things like, why did God create a neck? He created neck muscles so men could turn their eyes away when an attractive wool man walks down the street. (laughs) What a pathetic vision of spirituality. Like it, really, it really is. Well, you just, you just need to look away. And, and men will even say things like, I'm so godly and spiritual that I don't look at women at all. I just turn my head. If you have such lust problems that you cannot look in the face of someone of the opposite sex, you need to go get delivered enough so that you can look people in the eyes. Yeah, but, but Jesus said, if you call someone to stumble, Jesus said you need to have self-control, not other people control. Well, I, well we need to, Pastor Mike, get up and tell women how to dress. No, that would be telling them to control. I want to tell you and me, let's us control ourselves. Let's control. Well, if a woman's, if there's an attractive woman, I can't help but look. That's a problem. That is a problem. Jesus said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. He didn't say, if her clothes cause you to sin, take them off. Actually, that'd be a really bad thing now that I think about it. It's her clothes. Oh, what should she do? Take them off. But it's really weird. I've, t- I've talked to young ladies sometimes that have been like, oh my gosh, I felt so weird and dirty and objectified. Like when someone's like, we, we've literally had people like, I, I had, listen, I'm, I'm not making, this is a nuanced statement, okay? There, uh, yes, I believe in modesty. Yes, I believe we've got to be our brothers and sisters keepers. Yes, I think women can struggle with lust as much as men, all of that. My problem is the, the issue of, do you understand every female or male in this room, everyone that's in your life right now, they need somebody that looks at them and sees them as more than the shape of their body. And if you are struggling with us, I'm just letting you know, when Jesus said, if, if whatever it is that causes you to sin, get it out, what's causing you to sin is not someone else's clothing. It's something inside of your heart. That's what it is. That's where it is. That's where it is. And obviously, that's, uh, yeah, I can tell I'm going to have to undo, or not undo, I'm going to have to... <laughs> We'll do a sermon on navigating Pastor Mike's preaching. (laughs) Do you know that there's people in your life right now that need you to actually not look away? They need you to look at them. This woman might have been attractive. I'm so glad Jesus was able to look at her. At her. We, We need to be known. People need to be known. Stephen Covey tells the story of being on a subway train and and some man was there and and brought his kids and the kids and you just if you get on if you've ever been on the subway you're man you just want to chill you put your headphones in you read your paper you read your book whatever and and these kids are going nuts and they're just bothering everyone and this is going on for quite some time and oh they're just bothering one you know, all the finally Covey's on the train he, he turns to the father who you could tell the father was just ignoring it all like just trying to ignore it all and he says sir you know, your kids are a real they're causing a real issue here with everybody and could you do something about this and he looks at Stephen he's like no, you're right I, I'm, I'm sorry you're right I, I'm so sorry we, we just left the hospital an hour day an hour ago my wife their mother just died 
We don't even know if we're coming or going. Stephen Covey said his, his whole mentality changed when he, he saw something other than annoying kids. Hey, coworkers, can you try to see and love that annoying political activist that works next to you in the cubicle over there? Can teachers, can you try to see and see through the attention deficit, hyperactive, disordered child that ruins your classroom every single Monday morning? Neighbors, can you, could you try to see what's going on with the science experiment happening in the yard right next to you with the people that won't do anything in their yard? Roommates, can you, could, could you see beyond the, the fifth guy that your roommate has slept with and brought home when you guys had a rule we don't bring guys? Can, I'm, I'm, listen, I'm not, I'm not saying we won't direct people to God's divine ordinances. I'm, I'm not saying if you're Martin Luther King, you do not direct people to what justice looks like to line up with the justice of heaven. I'm not saying we don't get to the divine attributes of what objective truth is and what is good and righteous. I'm saying, do we, can we not understand that until you have connected with their humanity, the directing to divinity tends to not work. I want us to learn to love the unlovable. Look at this picture up here. This is from several months ago of the Project Rescue. Several months ago, we came to you and said, hey guys, we have an opportunity. You'll see this before. This has been a brothel for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. A brothel where little girls that are brought in there, like some of these communities, this is from one of the communities where 100%, 100% of the little girls have been sold into slavery because they were born in the lowest caste and they are nobodies. They are nothing but meat. They are reincarnated. They are, they're, they're karmic reincarnation to bring them back into the world to be punished. And so the idea for generations has been this brothel has been the location where this demonic trauma has come to these girls for generations. In the last months, this place became available for sale because of things that happened during COVID and whatnot. And many of you will remember because you were here several months ago, we mentioned there was the opportunity to buy this. They needed $800,000. We came as a church. We said, hey, could we be a part of this? And I put the, the word out there. Well, this is what happened. I put the word out there to you guys. It was the most generous weekend we have ever had as a church. We did not come up with all the money, but watch how God works. We went through the day and money was rolling in. By the time we got to our last service of the day at the university with, the, with some college students, right? I get there, there was a pastor from another church, from one of these big mega churches, like way bigger than our church, one of these big, huge mega churches. They've got like a missions director. They, spend, they give so much money to missions and all this kind of stuff. He heard what was going on. He heard that we wanted to try to do something about this. And he's like, whoa, wait, how much needs to get raised? He's like, well, what if between Greenhouse and us, we'd anyway make a long story short, he goes back to their church within a matter of days between us and them, there was enough money to buy that place. And this week, that place got dedicated right there. Yeah. Little girls who are living in a culture where they have heard you are nothing, you are nobody, you are nasty, you are unclean, you are unlookable, you are untouchable, and now there's a place of rehabilitation where these little girls go, they get educated, they get trained, and they are taught, you were made in the image of God. Amen. See, distance breeds suspicion. When you don't know any of them, whatever the them is, when you don't know any of them, it, it's so easy to have the caricatures that get drawn. I mean, guys, do you, as a Christian, I just got to tell you, almost every time I read something, I'm always like, that is not what I think. When I see the caricatures about like whatever like a born again Christian is. Listen, I know there are crazy, I know there's some crazy Christians. I know, I'm saying I often am like, oh, there's your caricature. There's a lot of truth to what you're saying. I'm like, oh, that's, that's not what I think. That, that's not how I feel. That's not what I relate to. I'm and yet it just kind of goes, well, friends, we got to stop drawing caricatures of whoever it is. Who, who is your Samaritan woman? 
that you're supposed to go and to stop drawing caricatures and you start showing up at Wells and you ask them to give you a drink. Connect with their humanity. Then direct them to your divinity. Sir, the woman said, you don't have anything. He says, everyone who drinks this water, verse 13, will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I give will never thirst again. Never. The woman said, sir, give me this water so I don't have to keep coming back here. He says, go call your husband. Now, he's going to go there, but I want to get real clear because this is the part of the passage that I think for most of my Christian life, I, I always interpreted this as, well, Jesus is getting to the punch now. He's dropping the pin now. He's calling out her sin. I, I'm just being like Jesus. I, I go online and I call out their sin. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, the prophet said, my, there's two things my people have done. Can you put that up there for me? There, there's, there are two sins my people have committed. One is they have forsaken me, the spring of what? Now, Jesus is totally doing double entendre here. Jesus is completely doing like, he's talking about living water, which meant like not dirty water. It's fresh water, comes from a spring. That, they, they would call that living water. God used in the prophets this metaphor, put it back up there, of living water, where he says, they have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they have dug their own cisterns, Broken sisters that cannot hold water. Friends, I do not believe Jesus is rebuking this five times married woman for her loose living. Women had no legal rights to get divorced in Jesus' day. Like a lot of, like if Ruthie wants to peace out on Mike Pats, she can. My wife can be like, Michael Pats, we are done. She could leave. She could leave me. You know, she could say I'm gone. You know, and that's, she's got every right in North America in 2022 to do such a thing. Women in the first century had no such rights. This woman is not married five times because she went off and married five different men. This woman has either been dumped or widowed five straight times. Now, she is living with a man now that's not her husband, but my point is Jesus is not telling her her five marriages because he's calling out her sin the issue is not her sin. The issue is her thirst. You keep on digging wells. You're looking for something to meet your needs. And I'm telling you, you can get another husband. It's not going to do it. You can get another pleasure. It's not going to do it. You can get another job. It's not going to do it. You can get a new boss. It's not going to do it. You can get a new neighborhood. It's not going to do it. You can get a new car. It's not going to do it. You can get another um, uh, plastic surgery. It's not going to do it. You can lose a little more weight. It's not going to do it. You can get more in your 401k. It's not going to do it. You can get more followers than your social media. It's not going to do it. You are thirsty for something. And lady, I'm telling telling you, you're just like all of us. All of us are like this Samaritan woman. Some of us are trying to meet our quench, our thirst with one thing. Some of us are trying to quench it in another. Jesus is letting her know the only thing that satisfies is me. Only me. I mean, I don't want to make more out of this, but I mean, let me just say it. She's been married five times. She's with a sixth man. Jesus is the seventh man in her life. In the Bible, the number seven would usually mean like completion and, and fulfillment. It's like you've done number one and number two and number three and number four and number five and number six. Are you ready to be satisfied? Because when you drink from me, you'll never be thirsty again. Is that there's something in you that lets you know that you're longing for something? In Isaiah 55, the prophet said, Come, all who are thirsty, come to the waters that your soul may live. He's not mentioning her husbands to shame her, he's mentioning her husbands to save her. He sent his disciples away. I mean, sometimes, by the way, you got to keep your people away. Sometimes you have to leave your homeboys. you got to leave your own political, you know, friends and cohort. Sometimes you got to leave your mother and father's house. Sometimes you got to leave the people that vote like you, talk like you, act like you, if you're going to go reach them. I mean, God knows. I mean, sometimes the way I try to reach people is I'm like, you know, I want to go connect with this person, mention Jesus, love them some more, mention Jesus, you know, connect some more, mention Jesus, protect them from a lot of the weird Christians, talk more about Jesus, you know, connect some more with them, protect them from Christians, you know, sometimes in religion. It's not just Christians, it's, it's people in general. In general, there's a human problem of trying to direct people that we have not connected with first. First, he connects with her humanity, then he directs 
to her divinity, to his divinity. And of course, she brings up distraction. She brings up like a temple and where you worship. Jesus does not fall for it. Friends, listen, the next time you're in a conversation and someone brings up the dinosaurs or evolution or, or LGBTQ or abortion or, or the, the history of the Catholic Church or you name whatever it is, listen, Jesus just said, woman, I'm telling you, believe me, there's a time that's coming. You, I love, he says, you will worship. Like he already knows. He sees faith in her. You will worship the Father, neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. I'm not gonna argue about all that. God is looking for people that worship him in spirit and truth. She says, when Messiah comes, he'll explain it all. Something in the heart of everyone is longing for this messianic figure. The Messiah was the hope of Samaritans and Jews. When Messiah comes, it's all going to be okay. And he says, I who speak to you am he. I am. If you've read the book of John, you'll know that in John chapter 6, he says, I am the bread of life. When you come to John chapter 8, he says, I am the light of the world. When you get to John 10, he says, I am the door. He says, I am the good shepherd. He says in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. In John 14, we heard last week, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one goes to the Father but through me. In John 15, he says, I am the true vine. She says, if only the Messiah would come. He says, he who speaks to you, it's me. I am I am. What, are you lonely? He is the one that you want. Are you scared? He is your protection. Are you broke? He is your provision. Are, are you anxious? He is your peace. Are you a sinner? He is your savior. Uh, have you blown it? He is your redeemer. It's literally one stop Messiah. Show up at this well and you'll never thirst again. What about all the starving children in the world? How could a loving God, listen, I can go there. By the way, it's okay sometimes to say, I don't know. I don't know. How does a loving God allow somebody, I don't know. Do you understand everything about, about sexuality? No. Do you understand everything about every, no. I do know this. I once was lost and now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And the one that made a difference is named Jesus. I love this. Just then, the disciples returned. Just then. Like, how amazing is Jesus? How incredible is Jesus? Just then, the disciples come back. They were surprised to find him talking. No one said, what do you want? What are you asking for? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. And by the way, this is some of y'all's commission this week. This is some of your commission. Go tell them, come see a man. Come see a man. Listen, I get it, man. There's, there is so much problem in institutional Christianity. There are so many problems in, in humanity and culture. There is no problem in Jesus. Go tell people, come see a man. Come see the Son of Man. Come see the King of Kings. Come see the Lord of Lords. Come see the one. He says, he told me everything I ever did. And then she, she says to them, could this be the Messiah? They came out of town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, the disciples urged him. They said, Rabbi, have something to eat. He said, I got food you don't know about. They're like, did someone give us something to eat? He said, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. And then the, the crowds began to come, and they said, we not only believe in you now, not just because of her word, but because of yours. Church, go tell everybody. Now, connect. you got to connect with their humanity. If, if you never connect with their humanity, it's, it's malpractice. But listen, listen. Many of us that are much more progressive, we have majored on connecting with their humanity, and we have ceased pointing to his divinity. You don't get healed by just connecting with their humanity. You get healed when they touch his divinity. People don't get forgiven just because you feel them. They get forgiven when they turn to the one who paid for them on the cross. Connect with their humanity, then direct them to his divinity. It's got to be both. If you get the order wrong, it goes wacky and it goes wrong. And I'm sitting on this plane with a man that says, does a woman have a right to do what she wants with her own body? And he looks at me. He said, because I've got a daughter in New York City that I don't want anybody doing something to her. We get in this conversation where he lets me know that he does not believe in a God. He was Jewish, but he doesn't believe in God, and God's a battery, and God, all these things. And 
three hours in the conversation. I, I mean, we're going, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like a sucker falling for every little, you know, hey, can we talk about this issue? Can we talk about that? And then finally, I, I just paused. He, he stopped talking for me. I just, I'm like, Jesus. I'm like, but let me, let me just have his heart. I said, sir, you sound pretty angry. Did you ever ask God for something and he didn't do it? And his blood vessels started to pop and his neck veins are coming out. He says, when I was 13 years old, my mom was on a sick bed. And I begged God, if you are there, heal my mom. And he killed her. I said, so you're angry at God? He said, I'll clean up the language. You're darn right I am. I said, so you're angry at somebody that you don't believe exists. And he chuckled a little bit, and the conversation melted a little bit from there. And I just had one ish, one agenda from that point. I'm like, I need you to know that the God that you do not think exists or that you're angry at in his non-existence, he loves you. Well, then why would he let my mind? And, and here's the, by the way, do you guys understand people can handle you saying, I don't know. I really don't know. I wish I could go back in time and bring my wife to go pray for his mom. You know? <laughs> I wish I could do that. I, I don't know. Why would, if, if, if the way I'm living is wrong, why, why has God let me, why do I have all these, I mean, talking to someone recently, they, they, they've got desires for very dark, destructive, dangerous, violent things. If this is against what God wants, why won't he take these urges away? I mean, someone that was not even from our church, but someone that was like, I want to do harm to people. And I, if, if this is so wrong, why would, why would this be here? Or someone brought me today, someone was, you know, throwing stuff on people's yards, just showing like, like this, this, you know, Jewish people stuff, like anti-Jewish people stuff, thrown in people's yards here in, in Gainesville, putting some things in people's yards to be on, be on, on, on watch. What, what about, I listen, there's things I do not know. What I do know is this, when Messiah comes, he's not just going to tell us everything. He is going to change everything. And I can almost imagine, I remember when Tony Evans preached this for the first time and years ago when I heard him preaching and he says, oh, let's just go ahead and, and play. You can imagine the woman running back in town and, and she goes back in town and, and, and she says, come see a man. And she finds the baker and says, I found a man who is the bread of life. And then she found the guy that was keeping all the sheep and she said, oh, I'm telling you, I, I found the good shepherd. And then she goes over here and she finds the gardener. She says, oh, I found the one who said, I am the true vine. And she just kind of makes his way. The guy that was building the roads, oh, I found the one who said, I am the way. And I'm telling you, whatever your need, he is. Whatever your lack, he is. Wherever your thirst, he is. Whatever you need, he's there. He loves, he cares. And church, the commission for us is to stop trying to create, push, crush people with the directives of his divinity until we follow his his way. Jesus doesn't just have a message, he has a method. And his method is, he connects with our humanity before he directs to his divinity. So go and do likewise. This week, go and do likewise. You're going to get a conflicting situation. And when you do, and when you're angry, go ahead and, and reactivate the joy parts of your brain. Like, oh wait, this is a woman at the well time. I don't need to be right. They need to be loved, and I need to be loved, and that's why I'm here right now. If Jesus is inside of you, you've got love ready to go. You got love ready to go. Kick it. Kick that love in. Trust me, someone's problem is not, listen, someone's problem is not their politics. It is not their race. It is not their gender. It is not their sexual orientation. Anyone that has a problem, it is their distance from Jesus who is closer than they can imagine. There are no unsacred people. There are just desecrated people who forgot who they are. Your job isn't to go, isn't to go correct them, it's to remind them, to remind them. You are the beloved child of the Most High God.